I am Joachim Jonander, and I will present our work on video instance segmentation using recurrent graph neural networks. This work was done jointly uh, with Emil Brisman, Martin Danelian, and Mikael Felsberg. So video instance segmentation is the computer vision problem where you're given a video and you want to detect, track, and segment the objects in the video. So essentially it's a counterpart to instance segmentation in the video domain. Like instance segmentation, you have a predefined set of object classes that you're looking for. Uh, in this work, we have worked with a YouTube-vis data set comprising around uh, 2,000 videos collected from YouTube. And on the bottom, there is a teaser of our approach running on three videos. Uh, most prior works rely on an instance segmentation method to obtain detections in each frame, and then they form tracks out of these detections. In this work, uh, we will take a causal approach where we proceed frame by frame, and in frame t, the method has already tried to tackle the video instance segmentation problem up to frame t minus 1, or up to the previous frame, and now it intends to tackle it up to frame t, or the current frame. So we have a set of tracks corresponding to objects that we believe that we have previously seen, and we get a set of detections in frame t. In order to tackle the video instance segmentation problem, we now need to do four things. First, we need to match uh, our previous tracks to detections or to the new detections in the current frame. Then we need to initialize new tracks. Next, we need to segment the tracks that we have settled on. And last, we need to score the tracks, providing a class membership prediction and a confidence for each track. So these four steps permits us to do video instance segmentation. And uh, prior works, they learn part of the video instance segmentation problem, but also rely on heuristics. For instance, they learn appearance extractors and train the appearance to be similar for different views of the same object and different for different objects. And this learned mechanism is then combined with heuristics in order to tackle the, the complete video instance segmentation problem. In this work, we ask whether we can instead learn to tackle the entire video instance segmentation problem, that is, these four tasks. So let us begin with the track detection matching. So in each frame T, we have a memory of tracks. Each track has the box and mask from the previous frame and also a deep embedding vector. This deep embedding vector describes the track and it will later be used to predict uh, its class and a confidence. Each detection has a box, uh, a mask, it has class scores, so a score for each object category and for the background, and also an appearance descriptor. And this appearance descriptor has been uh, extracted by uh, taking the features or the feature map from the uh, detector's backbone, uh, Resident 50 in our case, and uh, pooling them with a mask, which gives us a single feature vector for each detection. Okay, so we have information about each track and each detection, and we seek to predict the match probability of each track detection pair. This setup looks a lot like a graph, a bipartite graph, that is, uh, where the tracks are nodes, the detections are nodes, and the relationship between them are edges. And if we construct a neural network that is, that is able to process this data, and that exploits the symmetries in our graph, uh, namely the permutation equivariance of the tracks and the permutation equivariance of the edges, uh, of the detections, sorry, uh, then we get the graph neural network. And in order to apply the graph neural network, we have to construct a graph where each graph, graph element, uh, a node or an edge, is a feature vector. And the GNN will then process uh, these feature vectors or embeddings and sort of globally propagate information throughout the graph. Uh, we initialize uh, each track node using the uh, corresponding embedding feature vector. Each detection uh, node is initialized using the class scores from the detector, the, the box from the detector, and also the appearance. And each edge is initialized as an empty embedding, a zero-dimensional feature vector. Though as the GNN begins to process the, gra process the graph, this uh, the dimensionality of the edge embeddings will change and they will be filled with information. 
So the genome uh, propagates information through the graph, and it does so by interleaving updates to the edge and to the nodes. So a single GNN layer uh, first updates each uh, edge. Uh, so uh, each edge E is updated by taking the uh, edge embedding and the embeddings of the two nodes that, uh, to which the edge are connected, concatenating these three embeddings and feeding them through a small neural network, FE. Uh, each uh, track is updated next, and the update is based both on the track and all the track detection edges to which it is connected. In the GNN literature, it is common to take the edge embedding that are connected to the tracks and, uh, and then sum them, and then concatenate that with the track embedding and feed that through a small neural network, F tau. In, uh, this work, we also gate the edges with a gating function g tau, and the rationale here is that each track must be able to collect information from the tracks with which it matches, and this gating permits the track to decide from where it's, it gathers information, sort of turning off and turning on information propagation in each edge. Last, each detection embedding is updated, and this is done in the same fashion as with the tracks but the functions uh, f delta and g delta use a different set of weights. And note that all of these functions are equivariant. If we would permute the tracks, for instance, uh, the output of the GNN would be, would be the same, but permuted in the same way. Uh, so after applying this GNN, we have processed uh, the information uh, that we have available. Uh, then we uh, predict whether uh, each track or each, uh, and each detection matches. So we take the corresponding edge embedding and we feed that through a uh, logistic model. Uh, next, we initialize new tracks. And to this end, we introduce a new empty track. And this track is connected to each detection. And the corresponding edge is used to predict the probability that this detection uh, corresponds to an object for which there is yet no track. And we do it in the exact same way as a track detection matching, but in the GNN, this empty track is processed with a different set of weights, and the final track initialization probability is predicted with a different logistic model. So here, for instance, uh, the model has decided that this detection delta 4 should initialize a new track. So then we create a new track, tau 3, we initialize uh, tau 3's uh, track embedding uh, by directly taking the corresponding detection embedding, delta 4. Next, uh, we segment the tracks that we have settled on. So each track gathers the masks from the detections in, with which it was considered to match. The masks are then processed together with the track embeddings by a mask refinement module. And the mask refinement module tries to downweight the segmentation of tracks that we are uncertain about. Uh, and this is necessary because we might have tracks that are false positives. And the model might, uh, might it might have created the tracks, but it might also say that, well, I'm really uncertain about these tracks. And then it's important that the model is able to, uh, when, when it reports the final segmentation, say that, uh, well, I give preference to the tracks I'm certain about, and I downweight the segmentation of tracks I'm uncertain about. And that is the purpose of the mask refinement module. And last, we use the track embeddings to predict the confidence and class membership of each track. And we feed the track embeddings into a multinomial logistic model that provides a probability of each object category and the probability for the background. Uh, yes, the track embeddings and the predicted masks are then fed as input to the next frame. And we tr then train this entire model by feeding it a video and calculating losses on the track detection matching, the track initialization, the refined masks, and the track scores. What we noticed in our early experiments uh, was that the training would always diverge with exploding activations and exploding gradients. And this is a well-known problem when training your current neural networks. And usually it is tackled with a long short-term memory. So the long short-term memory, or LSTM, 
combines uh, some input with history. The bottom six equations here on the right are the standard LSTM equations. So normally uh, the LSTM has a recurrent connection going over some gates alpha and uh, a linear layer H or H cell. In this work, we instead want the recurrent connection to go over the entire GNN. So what we do is that we first take the output of the LSTM, tau, and we feed that through the GNN together with the new data, the detection of delta and the edges E. We then apply the LSTM to the track embeddings that are produced by the GNN. So thus we have an LSTM, but the recurrent connection spans over the entire GNN. And this works like a charm and seems to completely solve our instability issues. Yes, so we add the recurrent module to our model and we use, when we predict or when we refine the masks and we predict the scores, we use the track embeddings output uh, by the recurrent module. All right, so we trained and evaluated the approach on YouTubeVis and got 35.3 mean average precision. We then tried to simplify the approach. So first, we try to limit the GNN to the greatest extent possible in order to measure the gain of propagating information globally uh, through the graph. We let the neural network process each track detection pair in isolation by uh, concatenating the track uh, with the detection. Uh, yeah, and uh, we then update each track node using only itself and any match detection. So sort of we uh, restrict the, in, the information propagation through the graph to the greatest extent that's, that's reasonable. Uh, we also try to simplify the recurrent module. Uh, we uh, replace the LSTM gates uh, with only a gating sigmoid and a TANHIP ac activation function just to combat or stop exploding activations. We also compare letting our approach solve these four video instance segmentation subtasks to the approaches used in two prior works, uh, 30 and 11. So first we replace our scoring with the mechanism used in their work. And then we also try to uh, replace the track detection matching and the track initialization with uh, a mechanism from their work. We also compare to the state of the art and this approach outperforms all prior methods uh, but two. These two, however, rely on much stronger instance segmentation methods and while they obtain outstanding performance, uh, they run over an order of magnitude slower than our approach. All right, so thanks for listening. Uh, I thought I'll end with a uh, video of our approach performing on uh, the YouTube list uh, benchmark. So typically it's, uh, it, it's performing quite well, but it makes some mistakes from time to time, especially it tends to create tracks that are false positives. Quite often it, it quickly downweights them, but sometimes like here, for instance, we have an issue where we have two tracks tracking the tennis racket.